On the eve of the worst winter for over a century, and with France on the brink of war with the English, the 1400s in Paris were a tumultuous period, with a mentally unstable king and a collection of dukes, lords and nobles all vying for power in the background, catastrophe was only a single assassination away, which is exactly what happened on the night of St Clement's Day, 1407, when the Duke of Orléans was jumped by a gang of mysterious hooded men on his way to the palace, leaving the head of the investigation with a difficult choice to make, turn a blind eye to the crime and forgo any semblance of integrity, or uphold the law and throw the country into civil war. There's a dark histories where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Dark History Season 7, Episode 17. I'm Ben, your host as always, and it's lovely to be back. I hope you're well. This episode is sponsored as always. Well, not actually as always, but sometimes by BetterHelp. I'm just going to chuck this in here. It's not a full ad. If you are interested in uh, getting involved with BetterHelp, I do have a code. You can use it. It's betterhelp.com forward slash dark histories. Uh, but with that corporate guff out the way, shall we move on to something actually fun and talk about an episode? This one is called The Assassination of Orléans, The Rise and Fall of a Medieval Detective. At the dawn of the 15th century, France was a divided and challenging place to live, with a population still reeling from the Black Death that had killed so many less than 50 years earlier, the towns and villages were slowly returning to capacity. Operating under a feudal political system, power was spread out across counties, regions and cities and shared between various noble families. At its heart was Paris, the home of the royal family, the political, intellectual and cultural nucleus of the country and the largest city in Europe, its narrow streets carved out of the surrounding countryside. With a footprint spanning a mile wide and surrounded by a 40-foot tall defensive wall, the city housed a population of 100,000 souls who came from all walks of life, from cut purses to clerics and everything in between. The landscape, made for an intimidating view, with dozens of Gothic church towers piercing through the sky, though most were overshadowed by the vast Notre Dame Cathedral, already standing for almost 250 years. Carts full of wine, ale, pigs, cows, fish and grain poured through the gates day after day in order to supply the pack city, and as a crossroad for trade, the central marketplace of Laville served as a hub of activity. Noble servants, artisans, traders, merchants and beggars filled the streets that were lined with a heady mix of rickety housing, noble manors, guilds, workshops, slaughterhouses and tanneries. The daytime brought with it a cacophony of sound as merchants travelled through the streets for most of the working day, calling out their wares for sale or knocking door to door. Merchandise was rarely stored and so a constant churn of cattle, geese, wine, pigs, bread dairy products and herbs were carted and herded through the noisy lanes. The streets were filthy and the stench of burning charcoal, animal waste, slaughterhouses, meat, fish markets and urine that was frequently tipped out of windows directly onto the street all mingled to create a fairly challenging bouquet. In the background, church bells tolled to signal the various important times of the day. A single mechanical clock kept time for the city, a significant upgrade brought to the palace in 1370 which had brought a semblance of precision to the bell ringer's timekeeping, who, before the clock's arrival, had taken a more holistic approach. In contrast, the nighttime hours saw the streets practically empty. A curfew was in effect throughout Paris, with the end of the day signalled by a bell that rang out across the city at 7pm in the winter and 8pm throughout the summer months. Doors and window shutters were locked up for the night, whilst fires and lamps were all extinguished plunging the city into a pitch-black darkness. Being out of the house once the curfew was in effect was not a desirable situation, and not only because the laws prohibited it, but because it was a distinctly dangerous time. Although there was a night guard that patrolled the city by torchlight, keeping an eye out for trouble and ensuring people were not out of their homes, many of them were corrupt and all too happy to turn a blind eye to a swift robbery, if not directly involved in the first place. Even if one did manage to avoid the unsavoury types that plied their trade in the quiet streets after dark, they had every chance of running across a wolf that had strayed too far into the city in search of food. For the most part, the moats and walls kept the animals from crossing paths with the city's population, but from time to time, especially in the coldest winter months, 
they were driven to cross the boundaries, and stories of wolf attacks were not particularly uncommon. The more upmarket areas of Paris were dedicated to housing the official buildings, mansions and palaces that the nobles, knights and other court officials frequented. Here, the streets were pleasantly paved in grey stone, though the noise was frequently just as loud as the poorer or more market-based areas. The vast Gothic spires and manors blended seamlessly with the perilously narrow streets that were home to the poor who made up around 70% of the city's population, creating a tapestry of grime and grandeur. Outside of the paupers, merchants, artisans and nobles, the academics at the university made up an entirely separate social class. One of the centres of education in Europe, the University of Paris was a hugely influential institution, attracting scholars from far and wide. Theological and academic discourse flowed freely through the colleges whose members, falling under the jurisdiction of the church, held a similar position in society to that of the clergy. Monks, clerics, friars and bishops breezed around in their differing coloured robes and hoods, contributing a significant amount to the cultural output of the time through artworks, sculptures and especially the written word. Above all of the commotion in the streets below, the gibbet of Montfaucon stood upon a green hillock, serving as a stark reminder to all of where their fate would lie should they choose a less law-abiding path. Forty feet tall and built of limestone, the gibbet was a four-sided structure that consisted of three stacked tiers of arches atop a high wall, each tier divided by sixteen columns where the bodies of the dead, either hanged in situ or bought from execution sites elsewhere in the city, were strapped up to wooden beams and left to rot. With a capacity to hold 60 bodies, the macabre structure was frequently at capacity, supplying the local crows with a prime source of protein. One quite poetic description of the site mentioned crowds of skeletons swinging aloft, making mournful music with their chains at every blast of wind. Far from poetry, however, the hangings were brutal, with the art of execution not yet perfected. Victims were almost entirely fired into the abyss via painful strangling, rather than the more favourable snap neck that came later. Still, even those hanged could perhaps have considered themselves fortunate as another form of execution involved chaining a convict to the gibbet's pillars before simply walking away, leaving them there to die amongst the gruesome spectacle. Behind the gibbet, a large charnel pit acted as each convict's ultimate fate and a mass grave for the bodies who were unceremoniously tossed from the arches once their time rotting in the open air had ended. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the gibbet was commonly said to be haunted, either by revenants of the dead or by the devil himself. At night, a large iron gate was chained heavily in order to stop the locals helping themselves to the bodies, the remains of which were sometimes considered especially valuable in the use of sorcery and witchcraft, whose practitioners ground up, burnt or embalmed various body parts for both magic and medicine. At the centre of all of this chaos... The glory, the splendour, filth and squalor sat the King of France, Charles VI, whose nickname amongst the people was, perhaps fittingly, both the beloved and the mad. Although France was working with a feudal framework and power was decentralised, the King, Charles VI, was still the ultimate authority at the top of the feudal pyramid. The land he granted to the nobles beneath him was in effect a payment for one's council, as well as military and political allegiance. Beneath the nobles were the lords, who, like the nobles, were granted land, often in the form of estates and manors of which they were expected to govern. With such a balance, loyalties were frequently tested and power struggles were common, a precarious situation that was not helped in the least by the fact that King Charles VI was tragically unwell. Born in 1368 as the eldest son of Charles V, the young Prince Charles inherited the title of Dauphin of France, the heir to the throne, a position that he ascended to at the young age of 11 when his father died in 1380, having led a tumultuous reign, both celebrated for recapturing much of the land France had previously ceded to the English, but also commonly remembered for raising taxes, a move which aggravated both rich and poor alike. The first years of his rule saw power handed over to the advisers that surrounded him, his uncle Philip the Bold, the Duke of Burgundy, and Louis I, the Duke of Anjou, held roles of significant power and responsibility, governing the kingdom under a regency until Charles took full power upon turning 21. The regency was destined to make a return, however, 
when just three years later, King Charles suffered a complete mental breakdown whilst out on a military expedition in the forests of Le Mans. After riding through the summer heat, he snapped one afternoon, flying into a frenzy, convinced that he was surrounded by traitors. Riding in circles, he swung his sword wildly through the air, aiming at his own men while screaming at the top of his lungs that everyone was plotting to hand him over to the enemy. After a complicated struggle, where Charles killed several of his own knights, he was eventually wrestled to the ground and restrained until he fell into a coma. It was the first of a lifelong series of paranoid episodes wherein he would become deathly fearful of loud noises, claim he was made of glass, forget his name or that he was king, smash furniture, threaten violence upon his servants, disown his wife and refuse to bathe or change his clothes, sometimes for months on end. At other times, he would run manic through the corridors and afraid that he might escape into the streets and expose his struggles to the public, his advisers would order that the doors and windows to his rooms be bricked up, keeping him locked in and out of sight. It was a complicated situation, both politically and medically. Most doctors assumed that he had an overabundance of black bile and had been suffering melancholia, but less medically minded assumed that he had been the victim of a powerful curse black magic or sorcery. Despite mental health being poorly understood, the king's illness was taken incredibly seriously within the court. When two fraudsters visited the palace promising to cure the king with white magic, their ruse was uncovered and they were publicly executed at Montfaucon. It was a grisly affair and after being totally dismembered, their heads were stuck on spikes and their limbs hung from the gates as a warning for others not to try the same. Realising that the king was likely to be in and out of service for the foreseeable future, it was quickly arranged for a regency council to be reinstated, whilst their son, the true heir to the throne, was still a minor. Charles's wife, Queen Isabeau of Bavaria, took a prominent role within the council, along with Charles's younger brother Louis, the Duke of Orléans, and his uncle, Philip, the Duke of Burgundy. With the council poised to deputise for the king, the unique regency paved the way for a series of power struggles between the court's dukes, who found the king's illness offered them their own potential opportunities to shape France in their favour. Charles's younger brother, Louis, was an intelligent, well-educated leader with a keen interest in the arts. A prominent reader, he enjoyed collecting books and patronised several prominent poets and writers. Having always had an active role in the royal court, his political aspirations were well known. However, his political decisions were not always well received. In truth, he'd become quite an unlikable figure in the eyes of the public. Flashy and extravagant, Louis was the richest and most powerful lord in France and he gladly flaunted the fact. A fan of spending other people's money, he liked the luxuries of life almost as much as he liked the arts and he collected taxes, land and castles built using money from the treasury with almost as much veracity as he collected books. To make matters worse, Louis's own wife, the product of a diplomatic alliance, and also his first cousin, Valentina Visconti, had been close with the king, and whilst some thought that she often helped during his manic episodes, many others, probably afraid of the fact that she was foreign and Italian, stirred rumours that it was she who had bewitched him. There were rumours too that Louis himself had conspired to kill the king, when, at a masquerade hosted by the queen just days after the instalment of the regency, he accidentally set fire to a party of five men, which included the king, who were hoping to disguise themselves as wood savages by dressing themselves in suits drenched in resin and covered in flax. The flammable costumes naturally lit up in an instant, sending the revellers screaming around the ballroom floor in pain, and despite the horrified onlookers' best efforts, four of them burned alive on the spot. Fortunately, the king had been standing at a distance far enough to have not been affected by the dancing inferno, but still, the rumours pursued. If the dislike from the general public was bad, however, it paled in comparison to the hatred of him that stirred through the courts. A prominent womaniser, Louis had a pension for making mistresses of multiple nobles' wives, and often at the same time. What's more, he was never quiet about doing so. Many members of the court resigned themselves to the Duke's ways in the hopes that they might at least profit from certain political favours if they turned a blind eye to the Duke's collecting of their wives, but it was unlikely to have made him a popular figure within the court. Primary to this opposition of the Duke of Orléans, the King's uncle, Philip, the Duke of Burgundy, was the tightest leash on Louis, 
and a huge source of contention within the court. Keen to enact his own political aspirations upon the nation, it's likely that Philip himself had aggravated many of the rumours that surrounded Louis and his wife, especially in regards to the possibility of black magic and the conspiracy against the king. Following his death in 1404, Louis's path to power was made significantly easier, which only exasperated his unlikable tendencies, and before long he was mandating a second tax upon the nation, which he justified by pointing towards England, who France had been in an unstable conflict with in what would eventually be known as the Hundred Years' War. Realising that people were less than willing to cough up the money for this new levy, Louis ordered a rabble of tax collectors to squeeze the money out of people, tossing the poorest members of the public in prisons, pillaging their homes and forcing them to sell their most basic possessions. Despite all this instability and disorder in the royal court, Paris, and by extension France itself, remained vibrant and culturally rich, though the threats would continue to come and get considerably worse from both external and internal sources. The night of St Clement's Day, November 23rd, 1407, was a bitterly cold night. The coming winter was already threatening to be one of the worst on record, and light snowfalls had dusted the Parisian streets for several days. Louis, the Duke of Orléans, was visiting the Queen in her palace. Though she was technically separated from the King, she had to continue to produce royal heirs, and two weeks previously, she had lost their most recent child after he had died an infant, the fourth of twelve children to do so. Just after 8pm, the king's valet, Thomas de Courtius, arrived at the palace looking to deliver a message to Louis. The king wanted to speak to the duke on a very important matter and requested his presence immediately. Stepping out onto the street, Louis mounted his mule, flanked by four valets and a pair of squires riding a single horse. The entourage made their way to the king's palace. Out front of the small convoy were two of the valets jogging ahead of the pack with torches in hand to light the way with two squires behind. Behind the squires, Louis trotted casually along, singing to himself, as the final two valets jogged along behind him, also holding torches. With the curfew in effect, the streets were pitch black and quiet. Though a few stragglers were out and about, most kept themselves out of the way, ducking into the shadows as the valets approached. Pulling into a narrow street with tall houses on either side of the road, the still night air was abruptly broken by the sound of a gate slamming open as a dozen men swarmed around the duke's mule, holding torches. Up close, Louis could see that they were wearing religious cloaks, with large hoods covering their heads and cotton masks covering their faces. Somewhat alarmingly, they were armed with a host of weapons, from crossbows to axes and maces. A tense silence settled over the scene as Louis came to a halt and ordered the men to stand back. And then, a moment later, a man with a red hood leapt at the duke, swinging a blade and chopping his hand off in one swoop, the appendage hitting the mud on the side of the road. Before he could even let out a cry of pain, the other men piled in, dragging him from the mule and pummeling him with their weapons. In the commotion, the squire's horse bolted, taking both the squires with it. Two of the valets dropped their torches, bolting for the back streets to try and avoid being caught up in the fray, whilst two others, slightly more brave, drew their small swords, making a weak attempt to protect the duke from the gang of men, now swinging their weapons in abandon at the man lying on the floor. As screams of pain bounced off the walls in the street, a large man with an axe in hand stepped forward, swinging the weapon down onto the head of Louis, shattering his skull and sending him to the ground in a slump. A pair of hands dragged the body over to a pile of mud and tossed it aside, and then gestured for the men to follow as the gang ran off north up the road. As soon as the street had fallen back into silence, people began filtering out of the surrounding houses to see who it was that had been attacked. Meanwhile, one of the valets who had tried to defend the Duke stumbled into a nearby florist owned by Amelot Lavelle who had opened his door to see what was going on after hearing the valet crying murder as he made his way up the street. Hoping to patch the injured man up but fearing the worst after seeing the extent of his wounds, the florist rushed out to fetch a priest. Outside, the usually quiet streets were awash with sound, as smoke began billowing from the house that the gang had jumped out of as a fire spread through the ground floor. Two men climbed out of an overlooking window of a neighbouring house and pulled up tiles from the roof, allowing them to jump down inside and extinguish the young flames. Even with the flames out, the noise in the street continued, 
as uneasy murmurs made their way through the crowds, that the Duke of Orléans had been murdered. In 1407, the law was overseen in Paris by the provost Guillaume de Tignonville, who acted as the chief of police, judge, district attorney and head of the militia. Headquartered in an old fortress named the Grand Châtelet, de Tignonville was technically the second most powerful man in Paris, behind the king. Born sometime around 1365, he had been well-educated and capable of reading Latin and had spent time translating philosophical works into French before he inherited his father's title. Eventually, becoming a knight of good reputation, he was appointed as one of the king's advisers and worked as a diplomat across Europe before being promoted to the Royal Council in 1398, where he operated closely with the king within his inner circle. When he gained the position of provost in 1401, he quickly became a popular appointment amongst the public. Well respected for his integrity and character, famously immune to bribery and corruption, he was not a man to be trifled with and was said to aggressively enforce the laws across the city. Torture, executions and imprisonment were all part of daily life for the provost, who frequently oversaw tribunals where suspects would be tortured on a trestle, a device intended to stretch out a victim's tendons whilst a primitive form of waterboarding simulated drowning. Guillaume de Tignonville would have likely been at home with his wife and daughter on the night of the attack of the Duke of Orléans, when the king's chief military officer, Guillaume de Herville, burst in to tell him that the duke had been murdered. Sharing a love of the arts, de Tignonville had been close with Louis and the news would have come as quite a shock. If it was true and the duke really had been murdered, it would have wide implications, not only on the city, but for all of France. Who would govern during the king's fits of madness? The murder would have been nothing less than an act of high treason. The provost immediately sent for his lieutenant, Robert de Tuileville, along with his most senior officers, and once they were assembled, armed and all holding torches, they set out together for the scene of the crime. It didn't take much guesswork to determine the address of the attack, as the street was still filled with panic onlookers, talking loudly with one another. The duke's body had been moved inside the empty house the attackers had jumped from and had been draped in a black cloth. De Tignonville's first order of business was to check over the body and document the injuries. Two wounds to the head, one running from left eye to the right ear and the other running from left ear almost to the right ear. And the wounds were of such a kind and so enormous that the head was all sliced up and the entire brain protruded. His left hand was severed completely from the arm between the thumb and the wrist. His right arm was broken so that the master bone protruded below the elbow and the arm also had a great wound in it. Rather keenly, he concluded that the wounds appeared to have caused the death. Looking around the house, he noted that it appeared to have been left in a rush, a table having been set with food. Speaking to some of the witnesses outside, he pieced together a rough outline of the attack and then sent word to the Royal Council, calling for the Duke of Berry, Bourbon, Anjou and Burgundy to assemble for an emergency meeting within which he could give his initial report and confirm that the Duke had most definitely been murdered. The meeting was a hushed affair, with all the other Dukes in a similar state of shock as de Tignonville, and orders were quickly discussed and voted upon, with a state of emergency called. All but two of the large gates set into the wall around the city were closed, guards were posted to the streets to keep order, and criers were ordered to deliver the news of the Duke's death to the people. Concluding the meeting, de Tignonville was ordered to carry out a full investigation in order to get to the bottom of the attack and uncover the murderers. A daunting task, given the number of enemies, both home and abroad, that the Duke had gained. The provost acted with a swiftness that showed how urgent the situation truly was to the city. Without taking a breath, he ordered his lieutenant to return to the empty house and take a full inventory, whilst his officers were sent to the streets to round up any witnesses and pull them into the Grand Châtelet to give a full sworn statement. At the same time, any innkeepers were ordered to draw up lists of their guests and told to bring them to the provost. Meanwhile, Louis' body was moved to the nearby church of the White Mantles and an overnight vigil began. His hand had been rescued from the mud pile and placed in the coffin, along with his body, as well as any pieces of his head that had been found, scooped up from the roadside. Technically, the Duke had died in sin, as no last rites had been given, and so a priest spent the night reading the office of the dead in prayer for his swift release from purgatory. Before the night was up, an inventory was returned to de Tignonville, 
listing the presence in the house of one empty barrel, one table with two wooden benches, one old chair, one old tablecloth and one towel, four small beds in poor shape, four pairs of old drapes, one wicker basket, twelve pounds of hay and fifty firelogs. Finding the wicker basket to be the only thing of note, the provost ordered for its collection and then turned his hand to the early witness reports. It appeared that no one had had any idea of who had been living in the house up until the attack, though there were some reports that it had been rented recently. The escaping gang of men who had carried out the attack had been tracked northwards through the city, though the town guards who had tailed them had lost sight of the pack after falling foul to the caltrops that had been tossed behind them as they fled. The early numbers were quite erratic, though it appeared the group numbered anywhere from 12 to 30 plus men. As dawn broke across the city and people began filtering out onto the streets, the news quickly began to spread. It had been a long night for Detignonville, and it was already becoming apparent what a monumentally difficult task lay ahead for him. Settling into his office at the Grand Chatelet, he prepared himself for a long day of scouring through witness testimony, in which he hoped he could piece together the full picture of the night's shocking events. The following morning was business as usual in the city. Traders set up shop in the markets, cattle and livestock drove through the streets, and the chatter of crowds caused its usual cacophonic din. The only difference to any other day was the constant backdrop of church bells that rang out, tolling for the dead duke. Guillaume de Tignonville had been poring over several testimonies that had been given to his officers and put into writing from the residents of the street where the attack had taken place. Jean Pagot, a clerk around 19 years old, said that he had seen two big fellows in black standing outside the now-empty house earlier that evening as he had returned home from work. As he made his way along the street, they looked to approach him, he said, prompting him to ask what they wanted, to which they simply replied, nothing, before turning back to station themselves by the gate. Pagot had no idea who the men were and didn't think that he had ever seen them before, nor did he think that he'd be able to recognise them again. Drought Prier, a young valet living just down the street from the house, had been checking on his horses in the stable when he had heard a commotion in the street. Rushing back inside, he had gone upstairs in his house to look out the window which hung over the houses below. Noticing several other people looking from their own windows, he saw a group of men yelling at the other folks in the windows who were crying out murder, telling them to shut up, before he saw the men chase off the Duke's squires, who had momentarily returned to the scene of the attack, before they were threatened by the gang and ran off up the street, also shouting murder. Despite not really having seen any solid details of note, he told the interviewing officers with some confidence that it was common knowledge in the streets that the attack had been an assassination carried out on the orders of the captain of the guard of Ghent, Albert de Chorny. It was certainly true that de Chorny had a great deal of hatred for the Duke. His wife had been one of the Duke's many mistresses, and worse, he had publicly ridiculed de Chorny by covering his naked wife's face with a veil and then inviting the knight to judge the woman's beauty. Recognising the woman as his own wife, he stormed out denouncing the duke. Having heard the valet's story, de Tignonville thought that in all likelihood it was nothing more than street gossip, though it did demonstrate how long the list of potential suspects actually was. As a precaution, he ordered his officers to seek out de Chorny for questioning and to plot out his recent activities. Jaquette Griffard was another local who had given testimony that morning. A shoemaker's wife, she had been watching out the window with her baby whilst waiting for her husband to return home from work when the attack broke out. She saw the whole grisly beating and was able to give a blow-by-blow account, but was unable to describe any of the attackers as it had been too dark in the street at the time of the attack, and like the others, she also said that she doubted that she would recognise them again. The only detail of note that she could provide was that the man in the red hood who had started the attack seemed to be the leader and that he spoke good French, suggesting to de Tignonville that he was likely from the educated classes, either the university, clergy or the court. Probably the most important bit of information that the provost was able to glean from the numerous testimonies from that morning was that though no one knew who had been living in the empty house, they could be sure that it had been a rented accommodation and that it had only recently been occupied. De Tignonville ordered the owners of the house to be sought out and brought in for questioning, and at the same time, he took receipt of a wicker basket from the empty house. It was, after all, just a simple wicker basket with no special marks or anything that might have given away the occupant's identity. Still, 
he ordered a search for the maker to be carried out all the same. Perhaps he might remember who he had sold it to. Also, by late morning, the innkeepers were slowly starting to filter in with their lists of guests for the provost. One of the inns, the Sheep, had been a popular haunt for Deshawnee, and furthermore, it had been in the direction that the attackers had fled. De Tignonville had ordered the arrest of the owner, Jean de la Bouille, his wife and the chambermaid, and he had attended the depositions in person. Though, as expected, the de Shawnee lead had turned out to be a dead end, after the innkeeper admitted to knowing de Shawnee and had said that he had him stay in his inn several times, though not for at least a year, and certainly not during the last few days, nor on the night of the murder. Realising that de Shawnee was likely a dead rubber, de Tignonville switched his focus instead to trying to figure out the identity of the man in the Red Hood, who most witnesses seemed to believe was the leader of the gang. Fortunately, the Grand Châtelet had just seen the entrance of Marie Fouchier, the owner of the empty house the gang had sprung from. Straight away, she confirmed that she had recently rented the house out, though she had been almost certain that the tenants had been good people due to the fact that they had paid their rent up front. Winding back the story, the officers got her to start her testimony from the beginning. She told them that she had been visited by a rental broker along with another man who was very tall and dressed as a clerk in long brown robes and a red hood. She had never seen either man before, but said that the broker was lame and walked with a limp. The broker had inquired about renting her empty house, and after some brief negotiations, she agreed a deposit and a rental price. The two men returned the next day and paid up the outstanding fees, and when she asked who she should make the receipt out to, the man in robes gave his name as Jean Cordelin. At the time, she had had no reason to believe that the name was a pseudonym, as the impression that she had got was a good one, given that he had said that he was from the university and been well spoken. But, with the benefit of hindsight, she now realised that it was clear the name was likely fake. Jean was the most common name in France at the time, and the surname, Cordelon, was very similar to one of the most common surnames. In effect, the man had told her to write the receipt out to John Smith. Next up to give testimony was Marie Fouchier's grandson, Perrin Labbé, who had been with Marie when the broker and roadman had visited. Perrin said that he thought the broker was likely a foreigner and was also fairly sure that he had seen the cleric around Paris quite a lot, coming and going in the streets. He was also sure that he could recognise him if he saw him again. De Tignonville ordered the search and arrest of the broker and with some efficiency found himself face to face with him later that day. The broker turned out to be Francois d'Assignac and just like Perrin had said, he was a foreigner from the eastern Lombard region though now he was living in Paris. As alarmed as everyone else at the murder of the Duke, the Assignac was happy to cooperate with the investigation, not least because he knew full well that he would have been facing torture if he did otherwise. The man in the Red Hood had first visited him around six months prior to the attack, he said, way back in June, whilst he had been attending Mass. The man, dressed as a scholar, had approached the broker and asked if he knew of anywhere that was available to rent in the San Paul area nearby to the palace and the Duke of Orléans' home. The Assignac promised to make inquiries on the man's behalf, but failed to turn up anywhere suitable. After several months of dead ends, the scholar asked him instead if he could find somewhere near the Queen's palace. Once again, the Assignac made his inquiries and uncovered the house belonging to Marie Fouchier, which he suggested to the scholar, who seemed happy to take a look. His story dovetailed perfectly with Marie Fouchier's story following that, in that they visited the landlady and bargained out the rent. Following his dealings, the broker insisted that he had not met nor spoken to the man since. His testimony had seemed genuine enough. He said that he had known nothing about any plot to kill the Duke. He had only heard about it through gossip in the streets earlier that morning. Still, de Tignonville had him carted off to the prisons in the Grand Châtelet for safekeeping. The prisons in the headquarters were a fairly intimidating setup, located in one of the larger towers. Packed across four floors, three above ground and one below, they got progressively worse as the floors descended. The top floor had the best rooms, reserved for those that could afford the two pence per day fee and the four pence add-on charge for a bed. Below that floor were three larger chambers, known as the Butchery, the Beaumont and the Gretsch. These were charged at the same rate as the above floor, but mainly reserved for female prisoners. The ground floor of the tower was known as the Beauvais, and was reserved for the poor classes and charged at two pence per day with no option for a bed. They were overcrowded hovels full of filth and squalor, though disturbingly a veritable five-star service compared to the bottommost floor in the basement of the tower. 
with no windows or doors, the inhabitants were lowered into these rooms, known as the Hole, the Well, the Gourdin and the Oublier. At times, when the sun set in the sky at just the right angle, dim light managed to scrape through the dank air holes that acted as ventilation to the street above, but otherwise they were completely dark. The floors were shaped like conical pits so that prisoners could neither sit nor lie down and were full of rats festing on the rotten matter that filled the centre. Prisoners of this hellhole were charged a single penny per day for their pleasure. Back above ground, Tignonville mulled over Dassignac's testimony. The fact that the red-hooded cleric had been seeking a house for so many months showed him several things. Firstly, that the plan had been a long-running affair, and secondly, that the men had been tracking the duke and knew well his movements. Thirdly, it showed that the plot was relatively well organised. That evening, de Tignonville had his officers question the neighbours to the Fouchier house once again, though again, little of consequence had come up. Except one neighbour, who had said that he had been looking out of her window several days before the attack and seen a huddle of hooded men gathering around a table inside the house. Back then, she had begun to suspect that the occupants were possibly bad men. Focusing instead on the gang's getaway, that afternoon, de Tignonville visited several of the business premises that had had owners who had said that they had seen the men as they had run from the crime. At a barber's owned by Jean Leroy, an apprentice named Jean Fauvel said that he saw a large group of men fleeing from the scene of the attack, many on horseback, with the rest running behind. I saw lots of men on horseback rush past the shop, as many as twenty or twenty-four of them, along with a crowd of men on foot, a dozen or so of them. Some of the men on foot carried half-lances or unsheathed swords, some had axes or crossbows. They were riding along as fast as they could go, the men on foot hurrying along close behind. They all turned into the Rue Saint-Denis. The men on foot, two or three of them, were wearing white fustian jackets, each with two large coloured bands around them and crossing over the chest. The overlapping band was blue and the one under it was green, and both bands were as wide as your palm. Another apprentice backed up Fauville, though he said it was less men, likely around 12 or 14 in total. Following the barber's testimony, de Tignonville followed up a lead on the trader who had made the wicker basket. Visiting the shop, the owner, Jean de Pardieu, said he recognised the basket as one of his own and even remembered who he had sold it to. About a week ago, he said that a small man, around 50 years old, with only one eye and dressed in a long black coat and a silver cook's knife on his belt, had come in to inquire about the basket that had been sitting in the shop window. The strange man told the basket maker that he needed it to store about 10 or 12 pieces of meat. The basket maker had no idea who the man was, but said that he thought he had seen him before and could recognise him if he saw him again, which was perhaps not surprising given the pretty strange description. De Tignonville put out an immediate order for the one-eyed man's arrest and he returned to the Grand Châtelet. The day had thrown up some troubling information for the investigation and he wasn't entirely sure he liked the direction that he thought it was possibly heading. The barber's apprentice had said that he had seen men running from the attack dressed in jackets with blue and green stripes, and green was the colour of John, the Duke of Burgundy, the Duke of Orléans' own cousin and pallbearer at the funeral earlier that day. If he was somehow involved, it was not only treason, but a conspiracy, and one that would be almost impossible to bring to light. John the Fearless, the Duke of Burgundy, had inherited the rule of Burgundy after his father, Philip, had died in 1404. A military veteran, he had been captured during the Crusades and returned to France after a huge ransom was paid for his release. Bitter, suspicious, ruthless and cruel, he had earned the reputation of an unscrupulous politician who dealt in propaganda and subterfuge. Keen to peel the power vacuum after the king's mental health collapsed, he had held a long-running feud with the Duke of Orléans, not helped by the rumours that Louis had slept with his wife. From the moment he took power in 1404, he had conspired against the Duke, calling a meeting with his advisers and asking them to come up with a plan to kill him. Shocked at the suggestion, his advisers begged him to reconsider, suggesting instead a prolonged propaganda campaign against the Duke, which could help to deteriorate his power whilst posing a much lesser risk to himself. With the Duke already painting a poor picture of himself, it wasn't particularly hard for the propaganda plan to reap rewards. The Duke of Burgundy began painting him as an enemy of the people, obsessed with taxation, women and spending. 
In 1405, the pair's feud had almost led to a civil war, which had only been averted after the two men had been forced into an uneasy truce. Having heard recent rumours that Louis was plotting to kill John, John had decided to take matters into his own hands and ordered the stabbing of the Duke, sending a courier to Paris five days before the night of the attack with secret orders for an assassination. Fortunately, two days later, the Duke of Berry, uncle to both men, brokered a new truce between the two, holding a mass for their peace where they both partook in a ceremony of reconciliation, taking an oath before God to create an everlasting peace. The day before the assassination, the two men were seen drinking together at a royal council meeting where they had made plans to dine together the following Sunday. Though, if what de Tignonville suspected had been true, there was more than a little of the Machiavellian about the appointment. Suspecting the Duke of Burgundy with conspiracy put the provost in a difficult position. If he was to show any suspicion towards the Duke, he could find himself arrested for treason. But if it turned out to be true, the situation could very possibly push France into civil war. Sleeping on his thoughts, he returned home and debated his next move. The following morning, de Tignonville paid a visit to the palace, where he was to meet the Royal Council to give an update on how the investigation was progressing. Playing it cool, he told the Dukes that he had been working hard to uncover the truth but so far had not been successful. He then put forward a request which he felt gave him the best chance of getting to the bottom of the truth without causing any wider ripples. If he could enter the homes of the members of the Royal Council to question their servants, a move that at the time was illegal in Paris, he thought he might better stand a chance of gaining a significant lead to follow. In reality, the request was simply a bluff, but it was a move that John was failing to play spectacularly. The Dukes of Anjou, Berry and Bourbon all consented immediately, leaving John sitting silent, deliberating the consequences of allowing the investigation into his own home. After a tense few moments, he stood up from the meeting and asked the Dukes of Anjou and Berry to follow him to a side chamber. Once inside, he confessed to having ordered the assassination on his cousin, which had been carried out by a Norman knight named Raoul de Aquentinville, embroiled in a long trail of debt and embezzlement charges, The knight had taken a huge pension as payment for the murder that would see him paid handsomely for the rest of his life. Shocked at this sudden confession, the two dukes returned with John to the meeting room, where they did their best to casually call the meeting to a close after they had agreed to keep the confession a secret. The following day, a second meeting of the Royal Council was called, this time without the Duke of Burgundy. When John had caught wind of the meeting, he had tried to squeeze his way into the palace but found himself turned away at the gate by the Duke of Berry, who sent him away, and then went on to tell the entire council of John's plot to kill Louis. As the members of the royal council made their way to the stables to collect their horses and visit the king with the news, John made his way home, collected his advisers, and set off through one of the two open gates, fleeing from Paris. If he could reach Artois, in the territory of Burgundy, 80 miles to the north, he knew he would be safe from whatever the king decided. Whilst the dukes had visited the king, however, Sir Clignette de Brebon, a knight under the late duke's command, set out on the tail of John with a troop of 120 men. Fearing what he would do if he got hold of the duke, the royal council sent a courier on his tail, hoping to call him back before any catastrophic decisions could be made. Fortunately for them, John's men had been destroying the bridges they crossed, which put a premature end to the knight's pursuit. As John fled off into the horizon, seeking the safety of his own territory, gossip spread through the streets of Paris, as witnesses who had seen the Duke flee spoke openly about his guilt in having the Duke of Orléans killed. Amongst the public, it was an awkward time, as some celebrated for the successful escape of John, whilst others declared him a traitor. It was a concerning portent of things to come. Back in the palace, the king was not taking the news well at all. Angered at John's actions, the king sympathised with Louis' widow, who had returned to Paris to seek justice, and of the royal council, who saw the assassination as an act of high treason. Unfortunately, the following day, the king fell into another bout of mental instability, leading to rumours resurfacing that Louis' wife was a witch. With the king out of action temporarily, the council called off the accusations against John, fearing a civil war, and instead attempted to set up a reconciliation, offering him immunity if he would hand over the assassins. It was a deal that John rejected immediately, citing the fact that he had not done anything that should require immunity as reason. 
whilst the Royal Council had been trying to hammer out the deal, John had been continuing his noteworthy control of propaganda by releasing his own pamphlets to the public, in which he justified his call for the murder based on the fact that Louis had been saddling the people with onerous taxes and persecuting widows and orphans, violating high-born ladies, virgins and nuns, causing the king's illness and plotting to kill the Duke of Burgundy. The Royal Council tried a second reconciliation, calling for a conference in territory outside Paris, which they paid the Duke to attend, hoping to smooth the way for negotiations. Whatever smoothing they had hoped for, however, failed to materialise, and after ten days, the talks disintegrated, as John continued to believe that he had only carried out justifiable homicide. Rather than give any ground to the council, he instead insisted that he would ride to the king's palace and plead his case in person. The only compromise given on the part of John was that he would do so with a force of less than 200 men. A month later, John the Fearless rocked up at the gates of Paris dressed in full armour, flanked by a force of 800 men. Riding to his old palace in Paris, he ordered its immediate fortification and began construction of a fortress within the city's walls. If things were turbulent before now, they were positively chaotic after John's return to the city. Still as divided as before, the Duke went everywhere with chainmail under his clothing and was escorted with an armed guard. A week after his return, he held a public speech within which he laid out his justification for the assassination of the Duke of Orléans, enlisting the aid of a renowned scholar, Jean Petit, who would read the speech on his behalf. Dressed in scarlet robes, emblazoned with gold fleur-de-lis, John watched on as Petit began the reading. Major, it is permissible and meritorious to kill a tyrant. Minor, the Duke of Orléans was a tyrant. Conclusion, therefore the Duke of Burgundy did well to kill him. Petit then continued speaking for a further four hours, citing matters of civil law, all the way to Bible scripture, in order to justify the assassination, at one point comparing John to the Archangel Michael. One of the more interesting tangents was a black magic plot that John had uncovered, supposedly formulated by Louis, who had been conspiring to kill the king and was to blame for the king's mental instability. The duke made the acquaintance of an apostate monk, a knight, a squire and a servant who knew to go about the devil's own work. He ordered them to do a thing that would destroy the king and to accomplish this he gave them the use of a castle at lagny sur marne called Montjoy. He also gave them a sabre, a sword and a gold ring. One morning at dawn, these four men left the castle and travelled a quarter of a league to a field where there was a thicket. The monk told the other three to wait there until he called for them and then went a little way off by himself, carrying the sabre, sword and the ring. The monk drew a figure on the ground and placed the sword inside it, on the right, the sabre on the left and the ring in the middle. Then he stripped himself to his shirt and began reading aloud from a book. Soon a devil appeared. It picked up the sabre and put it down again. Then came another devil, wearing red. It picked up the sword, swung it around, broke off the tip and told the monk that the thing was done. After this, the monk returned to the other three men and they all went back to the castle. The following night, the four men left the castle again and went to the gibbet at Montfosson, where they cut down the corpse of a newly hanged man and put it in a sack on the back of a horse. Since day was breaking and they were ten leagues from the castle, they agreed to take the body to the knight's house in Paris and put it in the stable. Afterwards, they placed the ring in the corpse's mouth and passed the sword and the sabre into its anus. Then they said to each other, It is done. After this, they went to the Duke of Orléans and told him that shortly there would be some news. Soon afterwards, when the king was at Beauvoir, he fell gravely ill so that his hair and nails fell out. And very soon after this, the king went to Meaux on pilgrimage, and he was so tormented by his illness that it was a great pity to see. And in his illness, he cried, Save me from the sword strokes of my brother Orléans. Kill my brother Orléans, for he is killing me. And from that time on, the king was ill, and is known throughout the whole realm, which is a pity. And it is well known to everyone that the Duke of Orléans was to blame for his illness. By killing the Duke of Orléans, John suggested that he had carried out a loyal service to the king and that he should be rewarded with love, honour and riches. Following this absolutely bizarre performance, John printed copies of the speech out and distributed them across the whole of France. Shortly after, 
the Duke of Burgundy visited the king and got a signed letter of pardon, along with a second letter permitting him to pursue anyone who sought to dishonour the duke, effectively giving him carte blanche to punish anyone against his rule. The next day, the king fell once more into illness, casting a sudden vulnerability across the entire royal council. Fearing a violent backlash, the majority of the lords and nobles who opposed John fled from the city, including the queen and her son, the heir to the throne. As expected, John's actions were swift and brutal. Instantly, he set about carving up the royal court, filling it with men sympathetic to his rule. One of the victims of the clear-out was the provost, Guillaume de Tionville. Stripped of his position, he had all of his benefits, staff and housing taken from him. To rub salt into the wounds and further alienate him, he was excommunicated from the church and forced to perform an amend honourable as an apology for an execution that he had overseen shortly before the assassination. Forced to remove the rotting bodies from the archways, he then placed them in coffins where he was made to kiss the corpses as a symbol of peace and seek a pardon from the bishop. With Paris now under full control of John, it was a bleak time for anyone sympathetic with the dead Duke of Orléans. Fortunately, the king was recovering from his most recent bout of incapacity and by request of the queen, he had found it within himself to rescind his earlier pardon, stating that he had been misinformed about the crime. In a surprising alliance, the Queen and Louis's wife came together with a long list of demands and held a public refutation of John's justification, demanding a public confession of guilt, the destruction of all of his Paris property, an enforcement that would see him build churches across France with his own money and all of his land confiscated. Until his compliance, the pair demanded that he should be imprisoned, after which time he should be exiled for 20 years. If the Duke failed to meet any of these demands, then they would raise an army against him, formally throwing the land into civil war. Perhaps unsurprisingly, John chose civil war, returning to Paris with an army of 2,000 men, though before any consequences could come to fruition, Louis's wife died, her cause of death given as anger and disappointment at being unable to obtain justice for her husband's murder. Sensing an opening for peace, the king attempted to broker a truce between Louis's son, Charles, the new Duke of Orléans, and John, the Duke of Burgundy. Both parties agreed, swearing on oath to put aside their differences for the good of the nation. Sadly, it all turned out to be little more than theatre, and Charles, keen to avenge his father, sent a formal declaration of war to John shortly after, a missive that John replied to by stating that war would bring great joy to his heart. A series of skirmishes and battles were fought over land across the country, in a war that saw both the Burgundian troops and the Orleanists allied with English militias. Taking a move from John's playbook, Charles spread propaganda about the Duke of Burgundy, stating that he had allied with Satan and was setting out to destroy the church, effectively turning the tide of public opinion against the ruling noble. Eventually, in the summer of 1413, John was forced to flee Paris before he was ousted by the public, running to his own territory in Burgundy. The saga finally looked to be over, at least for the time being, and France fell into an uneasy and fragile peace, though it would not last for long. Two years later, seeking to take advantage of the country's weak position, the English invaded France. On the 25th of October, 1415, eight years after the assassination of Louis, Charles of Orléans fought alongside Guillaume de Tignonville at Agincourt. Charles was captured by the English, but de Tignonville was not so lucky. One of over 10,000 French casualties from the battle, the former provost died on the battlefield. Four years later, with France struggling, John once more set out to capture Paris. In a bid for reconciliation, the king's son Charles VII, now 16 years old, met John on a bridge at Montereau for what John assumed was to be a diplomatic meeting. Charles had other ideas, however, and ten of his men jumped the duke, breaking his head with an axe and running a sword through his stomach. According to several sources, his hand was cut off and cast into the dirt in retribution for the Duke of Orléans. The early 1400s had been a time of immense struggle and turmoil for France, but the assassination of Louis, the Duke of Orléans, had been a stupendously ill-advised move by John, creating one of several situations that tossed the country into a state of even greater weakness, right when the country's neighbours were peering over the channel, plotting their own devices against the country. A dramatic tale of consequences, the investigation of the Provost of Paris 
is a minor step in a catastrophic spiral that would eventually see the crown of France temporarily handed over to England and the loss of huge swathes of land to the invaders. In itself, only a small chapter in the long saga of the Hundred Years' War. So that was the assassination of Orléans, the rise and fall of a medieval detective, which I hope you enjoyed, and we'll talk a little bit about that after these short advert breaks. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Sometimes we're faced with a crossroads in life and we don't know which path to take. Or maybe you're thinking about a career change or feeling like your relationship needs some TLC. Whatever it is, therapy can help you map out your future and trust yourself to find the way forward. I've done therapy, you know, I've not been shy about it. I've done therapy a few times in my life, including uh, once with BetterHelp. And uh, yeah, I've, I've always found it really beneficial. It's always nice to uh, have someone who will suffer you waffling on at them for hours. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I, I've always found uh, therapy to be, like I say, like always found it to be, to be beneficial. And when I did do better help, I, I, I did quite enjoy it. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, maybe you can give better help a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible and suited to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire, get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist anytime for no additional charge. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash darkhistories today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash darkhistories. Well, me, that was a story, wasn't it? Uh, what to even say about that? Aside from the fact that I absolutely love uh, the, the, some of the descriptions of medieval Paris. It sounds absolutely insane. I mean... Aside from the fact that, you know, in reality, I'd probably live to about 25 years old. I'd probably die of some horrible disease painfully, um, you know, and, and, and essentially lived out my life in squalor and filth. It sounds amazing. It sounds absolutely insane. And that, that it's just it's it's the thing about I think when when you read about medieval things is it's you look up. Pretty much anything you can pick anything. And the description for it will be mental. That's that's just the way it goes. It will be mental. And the people uh, will, will all be absolutely mental. Um, but yeah, I, I love it. It's absolutely fascinating. The, the beliefs and such are, are really, really interesting because I think it's a really interesting time in that there was still huge, huge, huge amounts of um, uh, superstition. And I think that goes a really long way. Nowadays, when you're when you read the stories and stuff, you know um, all these kind of wacky tales, like superstitious tales. Uh, they're just they make for like really interesting history and great entertainment. Let's be fair. I mean that story that was written by uh, John to try and justify his murder of uh, Louis was just bonkers. It's just one of the strangest things I think I've probably ever had to read for dark histories. And the fact that it was so obviously made up and fake. It, 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 it was just, it was just wonderful. I loved it. It was hilarious. It was, it was a fascinating story. I thought, um, and and and, an, it, and a hilarious story at the same time. You know, you, we can, you know, it had everything really. It had sort of deep political, sort of Machiave- Machiavellian politics, and you know, backstabbing and and, and intrigue and and subterfuge. It had all of those interesting parts that were, you know, grown up and and and. And, you know, we can talk seriously about, but it also had men shoving swords into dead people's anuses, which was hilarious, let's face it. You know, so, you know, the story just had everything, I thought. It was it was great. Um, yeah, I, outside of that, I'm not sure there's much to really talk about, you know, other than the fact that really what drew me to the story in the first place, and I thought what was perhaps most amazing, was um, de Tignonville's, um investigation, which was, I thought, incredibly modern, um, you know, in its approach. The way he kind of uh, rounded up witnesses and took their testimonies and got them all written down. Because basically, the reason this story is so well documented is because the entire investigation was documented onto a scroll, um, you know, where all of the testimonies were written up and everything. So, you know, I, I found that really interesting how, you know, even way back in like the 1400s when, you know, let's face it, it was rare to be able to read and write. They managed to have, find enough people to document the entire uh the entire affair and you got real um insight into daily life uh in medieval paris from the testimonies uh it was it was really fascinating um so yeah anyway outside of that i'm not sure to say there's there's too much else to really speak about with this one 
say other than the fact that I thought it was just a fascinating story and I, I really hope you enjoyed it too so thanks very much for listening if you would like to contact me you can do so uh, contact at dark histories is the email address at darkhistories.com rather is the email address uh, there's lots of places you can DM me um, social media all the links to that are in the show notes or on the website which is darkhistories.com there are also links to uh, leave reviews if you'd like to do that or support the show in any other way um, whether that be you know financial through Patreon or just through sharing it with your friends which is you know um, just the best way to help the show grow really um, so yeah if you would like to uh, contact me you can do so otherwise Otherwise, I'll be back in two weeks. So until then, uh, yeah, take care. Sleep tight.